Hello everybody. Uh, today I'm going to, in this video, I'm going to uh, give you an overview of the first chapter of this course. A chapter that focuses on finite automata. Um, and I'll discuss lots of things that we're going to see in this part of the course. Some of them will make sense to you now, some of them will make sense to you later. So you can uh, revisit this video throughout the chapter, and now as an overview, and later perhaps as a short summary of this chapter. We'll start by introducing this model of computation, a deterministic finite automata. And this model is very simplified model, and, it, uh, and a very primitive kind of a model uh, of computation that uh, is characterized by having a constant amount of memory. The memory in this model doesn't grow with the size of the input, it's fixed in advance. We will refer to the problems this model uh, solves, the languages that it recognizes as regular languages, and we'll try to understand the properties of regular languages. In particular, we will focus on uh, very interesting properties called closure properties of languages. And essentially they are asking, once you have two, for example, regular languages, and you try to combine them in one way or another, do we get at the end a regular language? In the process of proving these uh, closure properties, uh, we will encounter and introduce a new model of computation, which is essentially, uh, which is similar to DFA, but stronger. This will be NFAs, which are non-deterministic finite automata. And these are uh, models that are similar to DFA, but are allowed to uh, make verified guesses. So this will going to be our first encounter with non-determinism. We'll introduce this uh, model. Then we will show that uh, the languages that are recognized by DFAs or NFAs are the same. These two models in some sense are equivalent to each other, meaning that NFAs also recognize exactly uh, regular languages. And this equivalence will allow us to complete uh, our proof of the closure properties. Once we prove the closure properties, meaning that we show that regular languages languages satisfy closure properties, we will turn our attention to the other direction. We will define uh, something called regular expressions, which is a, another way of defining languages. And here we will define languages through uh, this notion of, uh, through these, the same closure properties. So languages, we'll define a set of, of languages that satisfy closure properties. It will turn out that it defines the same set of languages. So the languages that are expressed by regular expressions are the regular languages, which are exactly the ones that are recognized by DFAs, which are exactly the ones that are um, recognized by NFAs. So in this model, we'll get a very clear understanding of uh, what can be computed uh, by a DFA and an NFA. Knowing what we can compute with NFA, with DFAs, we will turn to what we cannot compute. So the next step is to show limitations of DFAs, what they cannot compute. And we will show it through a, a two uh, uh, properties. One is the pumping lemma, which will be very useful, very easy to apply in some cases, and will show that several languages that are pretty simple cannot be computed uh, by a DFA, meaning that they are not regular languages. And then we'll turn our attention to the mile narrow theorem, which actually uh, shows something stronger than the pumping lemma in the sense that it can uh, completely characterize the regular languages. 
So it will give us uh, necessary and sufficient conditions for being regular languages. Now the limitations of um, DFAs are sometimes a bad thing, but sometimes a good thing. There are things that we can do in this model that we cannot do in more sophisticated models of computation. In particular, we'll show how to optimize DFAs, how to find the minimal size DFA that recognizes a language. And we will uh, kind of hint about the possibility of learning the languages that are accepted by uh, DFAs. Here, it won't be as strong as the minimization, the optimization property, but it will give us an opportunity to talk about learning as a computational task. Finally, uh, we will move from DFAs to a different model, a streaming algorithm that is uh, highly related. You can think about it as the uh, modern uh, incarnation of DFAs. It's slightly stronger than the DFA. It's not, it has memory that is a little bit larger than a constant, but still very small, doesn't grow too quickly with the size of the strings. And there are relations, they're not equivalent, uh, but there are relations between uh, DFAs and streaming algorithms. Whatever cannot be done by a streaming algorithm can definitely not be done by DFAs. Languages like that cannot be recognized by DFAs. But more interestingly, we'll see that the techniques for showing that things are not regular and it cannot be computed by DFA uh, can be extended in some cases to show that uh, natural things that we actually want to do cannot be done by streaming algorithms. And the last uh, topic in this uh, chapter will be communication complexity. This is a model that allows us to focus on communication as a resource of computation. So if you, you can think of two parties or more that are computed something together, the amount of communication they need to exchange can be thought of as a resource for their computation. It's a very interesting uh, uh, topic and we will uh, show it in the relation to streaming algorithms. We will uh, see that whenever you have a streaming algorithm, it translates to a protocol for communication complexity. So algorithms go from streaming to communication complexity. And because of that, uh, we can also see that impossibilities result, things that cannot have a good protocol in terms of communication complexity, that requires a lot of communication to be solved, uh, would give us impossibilities for streaming algorithms, will imply that the streaming algorithm uh, will need a lot of memory. Uh, so we'll see altogether that regular languages are related to streaming algorithms that are related to uh, communication complexity. And finally, uh, we will have an opportunity to talk about randomness as a resource for computation and to see how with randomness uh, things can become stronger. So this is very high level, but I hope that it can give you this map uh, that connects the different parts uh, of this chapter.